Welcome to our talk on respectful and inclusive code reviews. I'm Emerson Murphy-Hill, a research scientist at Google. And I'm Carolyn Eggelman, a quantitative user experience researcher at Google. Uh, we're a research team inside of Google that's dedicated to advancing understanding of diversity and inclusion challenges that are facing software developers. So when we think about code reviews at Google, uh, we think about a process that looks something like this. Uh, so the first thing is an engineer uh, authors a code change. Uh, they might be fixing a bug, they might be adding a feature, any kind of change they might want to make. Once the change is ready uh, for other people to look at, they'll send that code out for review. That might be either they choose some reviewers to do the review for them or they're assigned automatically. Um, and those reviewers are going to look for things like, is the code correct? Are there any potential bugs in there? Um, does it follow good design practices, uh, good architecture? Um, when they provide their feedback, typically is textual comments, um, they'll send it back to the author to take a look at again. Uh, the, the engineer that, that authored the code will revise the code once more based on the feedback. Um, once they're done, send it back to the original reviewers. This iteration might go back and forth quite a few times, depending on the complexity um, of the code. Uh, but once everybody's satisfied, uh, the code gets merged into the, uh, into the code base um, and the author moves on to the next change that they might make. So this is typically how code review works at Google, but it's very common at other companies as well. Um, if you want to know more about Google, uh, you can find out more about this paper from uh, Caitlin Sadowski called Modern Code Review, uh, a case study at Google. Um, and uh, it works very similarly at open source as well. So there's a bunch of benefits for uh, code review. Uh, Chris Bird and Alberto Bocelli talk about uh, these issues in their paper um, uh, where they uh, did some research about how it works at Microsoft. They basically found uh, six main um, advantages. So one, code reviews can help you find defects, right? The more eyes on a piece of code, uh, the more likely you are to find defects. Um, once those defects are found, the code can be improved, but not just defects, right? Also good for improving the design, improving the architecture, and so forth. Um, code review can also help uh, explore design alternatives. Uh, it may be that as an author, you weren't thinking of um, every possible way you might implement these change, and your reviewers might have some new ideas for you for making the change even better. So exploring those alternatives that are important. Code review can help transfer knowledge. So not only the person who authored the code knows about the change, right? the reviewers also uh, can understand the change themselves and uh, going forward beyond the review, they'll have some memory of what was done and why it was done there. So transferring knowledge between engineers uh, is important. Um, sort of building on that, they also find that transparency in a code base is good, right? That builds trust among engineers um, and increases the collective ownership, right? More people feel that they own the code and that's good from the perspective of uh, turnover, right? If you have people leave, go to another team, for instance, or just temporarily on vacation, um, having more people know about how the code works is great. Uh, and so code review can help with that for sure. This is a screenshot of um, some of the development that goes on at Google um, on GitHub. Uh, most of our development happens uh, elsewhere um, on Garrett or internal tool called Critique. Um, but you know, what we'll talk about today is all pretty, pretty common to all of these different review tools. So there's a few things that can go wrong uh, with code review. Um, we'll talk about three of them today. So one is an equitable review assignment. The second is negative interpersonal interactions. Um, and the third is biased decision making. So let's talk about the first one a bit. So there's research that suggests that uh, code review workloads aren't uh, necessarily distributed fairly uh, among engineers. So Daniel German um, did a bunch of research with software developer and asked about fairness issues. And one of the biggest fairness issues that developers complained about in open source at least uh, was that some people were doing a lot of reviewing and some people were doing less of it. So there's a feeling of inequity going on there. Um, there's another paper uh, that's outside of software engineering, which is an interesting the lens to look through to sort of understand uh, inequity in, in task distribution. Um, this is a paper about what they call non-promotable tasks. So these are tasks that are important in an organization. Everybody you know, wants them to get done, but nobody wants to do it themselves. So the example they give in the paper is uh, where you know, taking notes at a meeting, right? It's kind of important that it gets done, but nobody really wants to be the one to do it. They call these tasks non-promotable tasks, right? Tasks that don't really get you promoted, but are important nonetheless. 
We've done a little bit of research about this uh, inside of Google where we've asked about what non-promotable software engineering tasks there are. Code review comes up pretty consistently as one that people acknowledge is definitely important, but feel like they don't, guess, don't get much credit for it um, uh, when, when being evaluated. Um, you can also think of these as community tasks, right? Important for the community, for the community's health, even outside of a corporate context uh, in open source, it's still an issue. What's interesting about this research um, outside of computer science, again, is that what it suggests is that women are more likely to be asked to do non-promotable tasks. And when asked, women are more likely to accept doing those tasks. And if that follows, if it follows that code review is one of these non-promotable tasks, it seems likely that women may be more likely to be asked to do code review and complete those code reviews. And if women are spending more time than men, for example, uh, doing code reviews, that's less time they're spending doing uh, more uh, attractive uh, tasks, things that might get them promoted, like adding new features, for example. So an equitable review assignment is one thing that can go wrong during code review. A second thing that can go wrong is uh, negative interpersonal interactions. So um, interpersonal conflict, conflict between people in a workplace uh, turns out to be a huge issue. Uh, this uh, literature review uh, by Scheinman and, and Reed uh, look at um, what the issues are around workplace stress. It reduces productivity, um, interpersonal conflict can cause people to leave jobs. Um, it's generally bad for not just individuals, but for the workplace as a whole. Now, there's some evidence that um, interpersonal conflict uh, happens during code review as well. Um, we looked at a few blog posts here, for example, uh, where people talk about stressful, toxic, uh, insufferable reviewers on their code, uh, where they really, you know, as code authors, they really butted heads with their reviewers. Um, and there are definitely uh, sort of high profile examples of developers, especially at open source, leaving projects because the code review process was so bad. It was so not technically bad, but bad from the perspective of interacting with colleagues. Um, and so, you know, negative interpersonal interactions, serious in the workplace, but also serious during code reviews at the same time. And then the third thing can go wrong, uh, biased decision making. Um, so code review is itself a decision-making process. As a reviewer, I have to decide, is this code ready to be merged in the code base? Is it not? Will it ever be, will it ever be ready? Um, and like any human decision-making processes, uh, people's biases uh, end up uh, making their way in. And so in a paper that I did on GitHub a few years ago before I joined Google, um, we looked at uh, outsider women, these women who are uh, looked at men and women outside of a project who aren't owners of the project. And we found that these outsider women were more likely to have their changes rejected um, than men. But really only if you can tell that they're women, right? If they're using profile pictures and they're using gendered names, it turns out the opposite happens if they hide their gender. If women actually remove their names, remove their profile pictures, uh, they actually do better in terms of an acceptance rate of their changes um, than men. So, you know, it's not uh, conclusive evidence necessarily, uh, but it suggests there's something going on with, uh, with bias, specifically um, gender bias, uh, when people do code reviews. And this paper is about open source, but I don't think it's specific to open source. And I think that, you know, even though we don't like to admit it, the research suggests that it's natural to look at the identity of an author. Uh, Danae Ford had a good uh, demonstration of this uh, where she did some interviews with developers and then put them in eye trackers as uh, they worked on a code review. So looking at where people were looking at the screen while they were doing code review. So it turns out, you know, in the interviews, it turns out nobody really wants to admit that they look at the author when they do the code review. But when you put them in an eye tracker, they certainly look at the author. In fact, all of the participants that they had looked at the author during the code review. Um, I don't think that's necessarily something bad. It's just where our biases can creep in, right? I think it's natural. We're social creatures. We want to know who we're working with. So um, looking at, you know, looking at the author's identity when it's available is uh, it's just sort of a natural thing, as this uh, research demonstrates. So those are three things that can go wrong during code review. Um, and with that, Carolyn's going to talk to us a little bit about um, some of the things we can do to solve these issues. Thanks, Emerson. Um, as you said, there, while there's a lot that can go wrong in a code review, we do have some grounded research-based suggestions to do better. Uh, first up is inequitable review assignments. 
And rather than choosing reviewers manually, you can create a review queue where reviewers are assigned uh, in a round robin style. Uh, there are a few example tools here from GitHub, an auto assign bot, and a pull assigner. Now, there's an important caveat here that just implementing uh, a, a tool here that will we'll put in place a queue doesn't automatically fix problems here. Uh, you do have to ensure that there's fairness in the ecosystem around the tool, uh, including in the assignment algorithm itself and any inputs into the algorithm, such as code ownership, uh, in the process for adding people to the review queue and in how review tasks are actually completed. When it comes to negative interpersonal interactions, we have two tips here, one for reviewers, one for authors. There are more tips at this linked blog post here from the Google testing blog that we wrote. Um, and these tips actually come from our own research looking at quantifying pushback in code reviews. The first tip we have has two parts. Uh, first, don't criticize the person, instead discuss the code. Uh, even the perception that a comment is about a person can distract from the goal of improving the code. Paired with that, we do recommend that you provide specific and actionable feedback. If you don't have specific advice, sometimes it can be helpful to ask for clarification on why the author made a certain decision. Let's look at an example comment from a reviewer and see how we can revise it to make it more useful and respectful. The initial comment here we're looking at was, why are you using this approach? You're adding unnecessary complexity. We can revise the comment to remove the your and focus on the specific concern around complexity and readability. Uh, revision of the comment is, the concurrency model appears to be adding complexity to the system without any visible performance benefit. This revised comment removes the your reference and is more specific about uh, how the code could be improved. This leaves an opening for the author to write back with a revised approach or the opportunity to clarify if the implementation is an optimization. This kind of positive interaction sets the tone for a collaborative coding environment and more motivation to make changes in the future. The second tip here we have is for authors. When you receive feedback, do use that opportunity to clarify the code and reply back. Failing to respond to comments can signal a lack of receptiveness to implementing improvements. Here's an example of a short comment. Um, that makes sense in some cases, but not here. A more useful and respectful response would be, I added a comment about why it's implemented that way. In addition to this revised response smoothing the interaction between the two engineers, the extra interaction in the code tool itself and in the comments that make their way into the code help provide extra context, which can be helpful long-term when other engineers look at the code. You know, additionally, years down the line, it can make code archeology span easier when revisions are inevitably going to come up. The final area where things can go wrong is in biased decision-making. One way to help remove or minimize bias is to take the author's identity out of the code review. Anonymous author code review removes the name of the author while someone else reviews the code. We've experimented with anonymous author code review at Google, and we have found that reviewers weren't slowed down, reviewers maintained their review quality, and that while authors were guessable for on-team reviews, they were not easily guessable for cross-team review. Mozilla offers a Firefox add-on for both GitHub and Bugzilla that will redact author names during review if this is something that you'd like to try out for yourself. In conclusion, code review is a tried and tested process with numerous benefits, but it can also turn into an unfair, unpleasant, and biased process. To avoid this, we've presented several concrete actions, some interpersonal, some organizational, that you can use to improve your code review process. Please do use the Q&A form to reach out to us. This is an active research area, and there's still a lot to figure out. As a research team, we're very interested in what big questions you have about this topic. Finally, interpersonal biases do not have easy fixes. You may have some best practices from your own experience or from your organizations that work well. We would very much like to see those as part of the conversation in the Q&A forum as well. Thank you for tuning in today.